Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Charlie Elphick. Number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure that the whole House will join me in condemning the appalling attack in Nairobi and in sending my thoughts and prayers to all those who have lost loved ones. Our High Commissioner has confirmed one British fatality and we are providing consular assistance to British nationals affected by the attack. We stand in solidarity with the Government and people of Kenya and will continue to offer our support to meet the challenge to security and stability that is posed by terrorism in the region. Mr Speaker, this morning I have meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. May I join with the Prime Minister in her strong condemnation of terror? Uh, and uh, you will know, Mr Speaker, and the Prime Minister will know, that I first sought election to this House because I believed in more jobs, lower taxes, a stronger economy, and more investment in the public services on which we okay. all... Uh, rely and does she agree that since 2010 Conservative governments have delivered time and again for the British people and the biggest threat to that is sat on the opposition front bench with a leader whose policies would mean less jobs, higher taxes, a weaker economy and less investment in our public services. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right. What have we seen under the Conservatives in government? We've seen 3.4 million more jobs. That's more people earning an income, earning a wage, able to provide for their families. We've seen more children in good and outstanding schools, more money into our National Health Service. What would put that in danger? A government led by the right honourable gentleman, more borrowing, more taxes, more spending, fewer jobs. Jeremy Corbyn! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. May I start by correcting the record? Last night I suggested this was the largest government defeat since the 1920s. I would not wish to be accused of misleading the House. Because I've since been informed that is in fact the largest ever defeat for a government in the history of our democracy. So, Mr Speaker, Shortly after the Prime Minister made her point of order last night, her spokesperson suggested the Government had ruled out any form of customs union with the European Union as part of her reaching out exercise. Can the Prime Minister confirm that's the case? Uh, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that the exercise that I indicated last night is, as I said, about listening to the views of the House, about wanting to understand the views of parliamentarians, so that we can identify what could command the support of this House and deliver on the referendum. And what the Government wants to do is, first of all, to ensure that we deliver on the result of the referendum, that's leaving the European Union, and we want to do it in a way that ensures we respect the votes of those who voted to leave in that referendum. That means ending free movement. It means getting a fairer deal for farmers and fishermen. It means, it means opening up new opportunities to trade with the rest of the world. And it means keeping good ties with our neighbours in Europe. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, my question was about the customs union. Yeah. The Prime Minister seems to be in denial about that, just as much as she's in denial about the decision made by the House last night. I understand the business secretary told business leaders on a conference call last night, we can't have no deal for all the reasons you've set out. Can the Prime Minister now reassure the House, businesses and the country and confirm that is indeed the government's position that we can't have no deal? I think that the point that the Business Secretary is making and that he has made previously is that if you don't want to have no deal, you have to ensure that you have a deal. Now, I will give this, I will give this to, I will, I will say this to the Right Honourable Gentleman. There are actually two ways of avoiding no deal. The first is to agree a deal, and the second would be to revoke Article 50. Now, that would mean staying in the European Union, failing to respect the result of the referendum, and that is, and that is something that this government will not do. Jeremy Corbyn. Prime 
Prime Minister hasn't answered on a customs union, hasn't answered on, on no deal, and continues to spend $4.2 billion of public money on a no deal scenario. Yeah. Can't you understand? Yesterday the House rejected her deal. She needs to come up with something different than that. But, Mr Speaker, it's not just on Brexit that this government is failing. Four million working people are living in poverty. Half a million more children in poverty compared to 2010. The Roundtree Foundation confirms in-work poverty is rising faster than the overall employment rate. With poverty rising, can the Prime Minister tell us when we can expect it to fall? for the time she remains in office. Can I tell the right honourable gentleman what is happening? We now see one million fewer people in absolute poverty. Under the, that, that is a record low. We see 300,000 fewer children in absolute poverty. That is a record low. We see a record low in the number of children living in workerless households. An income inequality, income inequality lower than at any point under the last Labour government. That's Conservatives delivering for the people of this country. What would we see from the Labour Party? £1,000 billion more in borrowing and taxes, the equivalent of £35,000 for every household in this country. That's Labour failing to deliver for work working people because working people always pay the price of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corby. In denial on a customs union, in denial on no deal, in denial on the amount of money being spent preparing for no deal, in denial on last night's result, and even the UN rapporteur on poverty says the government is Well Mr Speaker Mr Speaker, it's very, it's very telling, very telling indeed, that as soon as I mention the report of the UN rapporteur who said the government was in a state of denial about poverty in Britain, Tory MPs start jeering. Tell that to people queuing up at food banks. The government too, Mr Speaker, has failed on children's education. Can the Prime Minister tell us what is her greatest failure? Is it that education funding has been cut by £7 billion? Per pupil funding fallen by 8%, sixth form funding cut by a fifth, or that the adult skills budget has been slashed by 45%? Which is it, Prime Minister? Hundreds of free schools, a reformed curriculum, 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools, narrowing the attainment gap for disadvantaged children. This is a government that is delivering the education that our children need for their future. But I say to the right honourable gentleman, he says he talks about being in denial. The only person in denial in this chamber is him, because he has consistently, consistently failed to set out what his policy on Brexit is. I said to him last week I said to him last week that uh, he might do with a lip reader. I think when it comes to his Brexit policy, the rest of us need a mind reader. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is very well aware that we want there to be a customs union with the EU. She seems to be in denial about that. But one of the problems she has on her denial is the flagrant disregard for dis facts and statistics. And the Statistics Authority has written to the Department of Education four times to express their concern about the use of dodgy figures by her ministers. When police officers told the then Home Secretary not to make more cuts to police, that Home Secretary accused them of crying wolf. With 21,000 fewer police officers and rising crime across the country, does the Prime Minister accept that the then Home Secretary got it wrong? I say to the right honourable gentleman, of course, as we look at what is happening, particularly at what is happening on knife crime and ser serious violence, we recognise the need to uh, take action. That's why we've introduced the Offensive Weapons Bill, and it's why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has uh, introduced the Serious Violence Strategy. It's also, we are also making nearly £1 billion more available to police forces uh, over the next year. But I also say to the right honourable gentleman, yet again in all of these questions about public services, he only ever talks about the money that's going in. What matters, what matters with the police is the powers that we give them as well. And 
And what was it? What was it when we came to the issue of knife crime? When we came to the issue of knife crime, when we came to the issue of taking more action at criminals who were involved in knife crime, when we said that if somebody was caught on the streets for a second time for a knife crime, they should be sent to prison, what did the right honourable gentleman do? He voted against. He doesn't support our police. He doesn't support our security. Jeremy Corbyn increased the number of police on our streets. It was a Labour government that brought in safer neighbourhoods. It was a Labour government that properly funded the police force. It's the Tories that have cut it. Ask anyone on any street around this country, do they feel safer now than they did eight years ago? I think we all know what the answer would be. It was that Home Secretary that not only attacked the police with that, but also created the hostile environment and the Windrush scandal. She promised to tackle burning injustices. She's made them worse, as Windrush showed. More homelessness, more children in poverty, more older people without care, longer waits at A&E, fewer nurses, rising crime, less safe streets, cuts to children's education. This government has failed our country. It cannot govern, cannot command the support of most people facing the most important issue at the moment, which is Brexit. They failed again and lost the vote last night. Isn't it the case, Mr Speaker, that with every other previous Prime Minister faced with the scale of defeat last night, they would have resigned and the country would be able to choose the government that they want? The Right Honourable Gentleman in that uh, peroration talked about the importance of the issue of Brexit that is facing this country. Later today we will have, we're going to have the no confidence debate. He has been calling for weeks for a general election in this country and yet on Sunday when he was asked in a general election would he campaign to leave the European Union, he refused to answer. <laughs> Not once, not twice, not three times, but five times he refused to answer. So on what he himself describes as the key issue facing this country, he has no answer. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition has let anti-Semitism run riot in his party. our allies, weaken our security and wreck our economy, and we will never let that happen. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity in Kenya and, of course, our solidarity with the people there? Mr Speaker, yesterday the Attorney General said that any New Deal would be much the same as the one already on the table. We know that the European Union won't renegotiate. If the Prime Minister survives today to bring forward her Plan B, will she concede that Plan B will basically be a redressing of Plan A? As I said in my, one of my answers to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, what we want to do following the defeat that, uh, that we had in this House last night is listen to parliamentarians and find out the point at which uh, what is it that would secure the support of this House. That is the question that we will be asking, but that is against the background of ensuring that we deliver on the referendum result, that we leave the European Union and we recognise what people were voting for when they voted in that referendum result, an end to free movement, ensuring that we could have, trade and negotiate, uh, have our own trade policy with the rest of the world, be fairer to our farmers, fairer to our fishermen, but maintain that good relationship with our neighbours in the EU. Ian Blackbird. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, that simply didn't address the question. The EU won't renegotiate. The Prime Minister has no answer. She has failed. What an omni shambles from this government, suffering a historic and a humiliating defeat, the worst for any UK government. Westminster is in chaos. But in Scotland we stand united. Mr Speaker, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain, and we will not allow our country to be dragged out of the European Union or brought down by this Tory government. The Prime Minister knew that this deal was dead since Chequers. She knew it was dead when she moved the meaningful vote, and she knows, as we all know, last night was the last straw. The Prime Minister must now seek the confidence of the people. 
not simply the confidence of this House. The only way forward is to extend Article 50 and ask the people of Scotland and of the United Kingdom whether they want the Prime Minister's deal or whether they want to remain in the European Union. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister now must legislate for a people's vote. To the right honourable gentleman, as he knows, I, as I, and as I have said before, this House legislated for a people's vote. It legislated for a people's vote that was held in 2016, and that vote, that vote determined that the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. He talks about our country. Our country is the whole of the United Kingdom. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it is for the whole of the United Kingdom that we will be looking for a solution that secures the support of this House and ensures that this Parliament delivers on the vote of the people. Kyle yeah, 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 yeah. The Prime Minister's defeat yesterday was historic and titanic. Everything has changed and she has to change too. Yesterday, thousands of people descended on Parliament Square to demand their say. Nobody was taken to the streets demanding a Norway or a Canada option. She, when she came to power, she promised that she would give people more power over their lives. If she is not going to give people power to have a say over this deal, then what is the point of that promise in the first place? I say to the honourable gentleman that he cannot ignore the fact that in the 2016 referendum that in the 2016 referendum the people of this country voted to leave the european union and i believe that it is a duty not just of government but of parliament to ensure that we deliver on that we will be we will be speaking to parliamentarians in my, my own party, the DUP, across the House, about uh, finding a way that secures the support of the House uh, for the way forward. But I say to the Honourable Gentleman once again, a vote was taken in 2016, and I believe it is incumbent on this Parliament to deliver on that vote. Seema Malhotra. Mr Speaker, last night in this House, after the biggest de government defeat in history, the Prime Minister said the Government will approach meetings with parliamentarians in a constructive spirit. But it appears that cross-party talks means inviting people in to tell them why her deal is best or to see if they've got any ideas on how to get her deal through. <laughs> Apparently now, Number 10's resistance to a customs union with the European Union after Brexit was a principle and not a red line. So which is it? And if she is genuinely seeking to work with Parliament and hear the will of this House, is she prepared to change any of her red lines and work to bring Parliament and the country together on how we move forward? As I said in the House last night, I will be talking to parliamentarians on, in my own party, in the DUP, in other parties across this House, and will be, and will be ensuring and will be looking to see what it is that can secure the support of this House. But again, I say to the Honourable Lady, as I have said to her Honourable and Right Honourable friends, that what this House must always have in mind is the importance of delivering on the vote of the people to leave the European Union. Mrs. Helen Grant. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that if we fail to deliver on Brexit, the public perception of politicians in this country will be at an all-time low? Yes. I, I, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. And this, and this is so important. I believe that if we fail to deliver on what the British people instructed us to do in the vote of the referendum, that the, uh, that the views of the British people of this House, of Parliament and of politicians will be at an all-time low, because they will, have lost, they will have lost faith in politicians across the whole of this Parliament. We need to deliver Brexit for the British people. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I sat through 
uh, many hours on every day but one of the recent debate, and I did listen very carefully to the extraordinary range of views that was expressed on all sides throughout it. Uh, and it did seem to me that the only clear majorities in this House on a cross-party basis are firstly against leaving with no deal, uh, 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 again in favour of extending Article 50 to give us time to sort out what it is we now propose to do, and in favour of a customs union, some form of customs union, and some sufficient regulatory alignment to keep all our borders between the United Kingdom and the European Union open after we leave. Will the Prime Minister not, just as I have had to accept that the majority in this House is committed to the UK leaving the European Union, that she must accept that she must now modify her red lines, which she created for herself at Lancaster House, and find a cross-party majority, which will be along the lines that I have indicated. My, my right honourable friend started off by saying there were a considerable number, was a considerable number of views across this House. It is precisely because of that that we will be undertaking the discussions with members, uh, with parliamentarians, that I indicated would happen last night. That I indicated would happen last night. He talks about the uh, possible extension of Article 50. Of course, Article 50 cannot be extended by the UK. It has to be extended in, in uh, consultation, in agreement with the European Union. The government's policy, the government's policy, is that we're leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. But the, but the EU would only extend Article 50 if actually it was clear there was a plan that was moving towards an agreed deal. That's that is the crucial element of ensuring we deliver on Brexit, is being able to get the agreement of this House to the deal that will deliver on the referendum result, leave the European Union and recognise what lay behind that vote when people voted to leave. Dr Philip Lee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend, particularly since last night, recognise that in these complex circumstances, that her role as Prime Minister now is to create the political environment in which solutions to the Brexit conundrum can be found and not to continue with a plan expecting a different outcome? And does she also accept then that if she cannot get what she wants, that she will need to change her mind in order to secure public confidence? Can I say to my honourable friend that uh, as I've uh, pointed out today and as I said last night, it is precisely because we recognise that we need to uh, understand rather better where it is, that, what it is that can command the support of this House and can secure the poise point of this House, that we will be looking and we will be talking to parliamentarians across the House. That includes parliamentarians, includes my colleagues, honourable and right honourable friends, includes the uh, Democratic Unionist Party and parliamentarians across other houses, because, as my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Rushcliffe, said, there is quite a variety of views across this House about what is right. Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. Aye, aye, aye. Mr Speaker, sir, the deal that was defeated last night is a product of her own red lines. So which of those red lines is she willing to give up in order to get the compromise she seeks. We will be, as I said last night, we will be approaching these talks, these discussions, in a constructive spirit. But underlying what we will be doing is the need to ensure that we deliver on the referendum result and we deliver Brexit. Ronnie Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said in a recent survey that four million in-work workers are living in poverty. Isn't that a damning report of nine years of this Tory Absolutely. government? And will she stop being so hard and fast and call a general election? Here it is. I say to the honourable gentleman, I, I referred earlier to the figures of uh, people in absolute poverty, which are at a record low under this government. Uh, but he talks about people who are in work. What, this government has taken a number of steps, a number of steps to help those people who are in work. We have been cutting cut taxes for 32 million people. We've increased the national uh, living wage. We've helped people by freezing fuel duty. And what happened? What happened in a number of the measures that we have taken to give to give financial
financial help to people who are just about managing, to people the sort of people he's talking about. Unfortunately, in so many cases, the Labour Party opposed those measures. Martin Vickers. Mr Speaker, in an article I posted on my website in November, I, put, I concluded by saying hopefully we will eventually come to a position that both sides who support the agreement and those like me who oppose it can coalesce. I believe this could happen over coming weeks, though there may be more drama before we reach that point. Mr Speaker, I think we've all had our fair share of drama, but would my right honourable friend agree, agree with me that it's not both sides, meaning remain and leave, who must coalesce around an agreement, it is the European Union. And can I urge her to continue uh, negotiations with Europe in, in the hope of them showing some flexibility? Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for pointing out a very, what is a very obvious point, but actually has been, not been raised by those who have been talking about the sort of discussions we will have across this Parliament, which is, I want to see what will secure the support of the House, but of course we do have to ensure that that can secure the support of the European Union, because this is a treaty and agreement between two parties. And as I said last night, uh, once we have uh, those ideas from the, uh, from the House, I will of course take those to the European Union. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Further to her point of order last night and the questions asked so far at this question time, does my right hon. Friend agree that we all need to maintain maximum flexibility if we are to build a consensus around Brexit in this House? Yes, as I said last night, we will approach the discussions we will have with honourable members and right honourable members across this House with, uh, in a constructive spirit. The, the one, uh, and as I said earlier, what we do need to retain, though, as we're looking at those uh, discussions to find what will secure the support of the House, is to remember that what we are doing is finding a way to deliver Brexit and deliver on the vote of the British people. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I don't like to worry the Prime Minister, but it is notable that I had a question at David Cameron's final PMQs. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, after the Prime Minister's crushing defeat, she said, EU citizens who have made their home here deserve clarity on these questions as soon as possible. Mr Speaker, the clarity is in the Prime Minister's own hands, so will she now show leadership Prove that she values EU nationals, scrap the settled, yep. the settled status yep. fee, and give a guarantee here, here. to all EU nationals that their future in the UK is secure. Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, the withdrawal agreement that was negotiated with the European Union set out the ways in which EU citizens' rights would be guaranteed here in the United Kingdom and reciprocal rights for UK citizens in the European Union would be guaranteed. Now, the vote last night rejected that package of the withdrawal agreement and the, uh, and the political declaration. We have said as a government and made it clear that in a no-deal situation, we would also guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are living here, and we stand by that. Gillian Keegan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No country has ever left the EU using Article 50, so I do not underestimate the challenge. But back in the real world, businesses up and down the country, with the possible exception of Weatherspoons, are extremely disappointed with last night's vote, and short-term investment decisions are still on hold or going against the UK. Would the Prime Minister agree that protecting just-in-time supply chains, on which my constituents' jobs depend, must be at the heart of any solution? Can I say to my friend that she has raised a very important point because, of course, what the deal we put to Parliament last night, one of the things it did do was to protect those just-in-time supply chain models, and our position on their importance has not changed. Uh, today, as we look ahead to today's vote, backing the government today will enable us to find a way forward on Brexit and on the issues, as she says, that matter at home and ensure that this country has the government it needs to take it forward, uh, to take it forward, to deliver on the referendum and, as she says, ensure that we are protecting the jobs not just of her constituents but jobs around the whole of this country. Abel. Uh, can I, first of all, welcome the Prime Minister's offer of cross-party talks? And she will remember, as we're former colleagues, that my party has a record of working with others in the national interest. <laughs> but can I, can I, uh, can I, but can I say to, can, can 
I say to her that she shouldn't even bother lifting the telephone to opposition parties unless she's willing to rule out categorically a New Deal Brexit, unless she's willing to enter into a constructive conversation about a people's vote. I say to the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman, as I said earlier, of course, there are two ways of avoiding a no deal. One is to have a deal and one is to stay in the European Union. We will not be staying in the European Union, uh, but I look forward to having, I'm always, I'm always, I'm happy to have constructive discussions with party leaders who want to put the national interest first. Sadly, from everything I've heard, not every party leader wants to do that. Dr. Sarah Wallace, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, driving off a cliff never ends well. Um, particularly if it results in a crash and burn Brexit with no deal in just 72 days' time. But there's another way that we can avoid this, and that is to be realistic in extending Article 50 to allow us to put a realistic negotiated Brexit direct to the British people, to yeah, ask if it has yeah. their consent, but also to include an option to remain with the excellent deal we already have. Yeah. To my honourable friend, as, as she will not be surprised to hear because I've said it this, uh, uh, in Prime Minister's questions today. I believe we should deliver on the vote of the referendum in 2016, that we should be delivering Brexit. As I've indicated earlier to her, uh, the, uh, uh, she and others have talked about extending Article 50. Uh, the European Union would only extend Article 50 in the circumstances in which it was going to be possible to come to an agreement on a deal. The talks that we will be having, the discussions I'll be having with parliamentarians across this House will be aimed at ensuring that we can find a way to secure a deal that will get the support of this House. Order.